As I ran toward the exhibit, I knew we should have killed the animal when we had the chance. I had a rifle in one hand and my phone in the other as I dodged around strolling visitors. Move! I shouted. There were children with their parents, teenagers wandering around on their own, and the occasional group of adults that came to see the animals. The radio on my hip came to life. The security guard was asking where I was. I didn't bother answering. As I came to the jackal exhibit, I saw a crowd of onlookers standing around. No one was screaming, so I figured I still had time to stop things from getting out of hand. Move, I said, shoving through people. The security guard, Colson, looked over at me as I approached. Get these people out of here, I told him. I looked into the enclosure and saw a man in his mid-twenties trying to approach a wary jackal. I could see that it was Banshee he was approaching, the female of the pair. I looked frantically around for Raven, the male, but couldn't find him. The exhibit was designed to approximate the animal's natural woodland habitat, so there were plenty of places to hide. People thought jackals were cute, looking like a combination of a dog, a coyote, and a wolf. But they were also highly territorial. And this man who had somehow climbed over the fences was encroaching on Raven's territory. The exhibit was separated from the viewing area by a metal railing and two fences, each spaced 10 feet apart. The top of each fence included a segment about two feet long that angled out at 45 degrees to make it hard for people to climb over. The guy clearly wanted to be in there. Hey! I shouted. Get out of there! The man ignored me. I could hear him beckoning to the jackal, who stood looking at him near a rock formation. Pocketing my phone, I raised the rifle to get it ready, just in case. I had another zookeeper going to the employees only area where there was a back door to the exhibit. The door led to the fully enclosed area where we kept the jackals when they needed to be inspected for injuries by a veterinarian. But I didn't want to risk another person getting close to Raven, wherever he was. I hadn't given the other zookeeper the go ahead to open the door. Then I saw the animal, his mostly black body darting out from behind a bush near the back of the exhibit, ready to defend his territory. The idiot saw him too, straightening and turning to run as the jackal closed in on him. Get down! I screamed, rifle at my shoulder and safety off. But the guy ignored me again. Raven closed the distance easily and then bit down hard on the man's leg. The man shouted and stumbled to the ground, still a good 10 yards from the fence. I finally had a shot, so I took it, putting a bullet in Raven's skull. The jackal went down. The man, now crying, limped up and toward the fence. The other way, I said, pointing toward the back of the habitat. Now the disaster had been averted, he could go out that way. There's a door. But as the man turned around, I saw Raven twitch. Wait, I said, but he had already stopped, staring at the downed jackal. Raven twitched again, lifting his head. It wasn't possible, but my eyes weren't deceiving me. And as the animal got to its feet, it began to transform. It had tasted human flesh, just like last time, and it was turning. It quickly grew in size, its black fur thinning as its skin stretched, its hind legs extended as its front paws grew to resemble furry, clawed fingers. The animal's jaw stretched, sharp teeth growing in proportion. All the while, its wolf-like yellow eyes were fixed on the interloper. The man had been watching this transformation in shocked silence, but now that it was finishing up, Standing nearly seven feet tall, he turned toward the fence and started to climb. I sidestepped and fired again at the beast. The bullet punched into its bulbous ribcage just above its skinny abdomen, but the beast did not slow. It pounced, ripping the man from the fence with teeth and claws. The man screamed as the jackal went to work, ripping into his flesh as blood sprayed everywhere. I was suddenly aware of frightened screams nearby, turning to look. I saw that the security guard hadn't finished his job. There was a small crowd nearby, and they stared, along with the guard, at the gory scene unfolding in the exhibit. Presently, a few of them broke and ran. They were the smart ones. Now, as I watched the beast tearing the man apart, I knew it wouldn't be hard for it to escape. I had a few moments to regret my decision not to kill the animal once I'd learned about its strange power its power to transform only after tasting human flesh. I thought I could prevent it from happening again, and it was against everything I believed to execute an animal. 
but I had a terrible feeling those beliefs were going to get me killed. I told everyone to run, and then I turned back to fire the rest of my rounds at the beast. It did nothing but piss him off. Momentarily, he turned and fixed his yellow eyes on me through the fences. As I stepped away from the pile of meat and bones that had once been a man, I dropped the rifle and ran. Behind me, I heard the rattle of the beast landing on a chain link fence. It had never been all that common for me to stay past midnight at the zoo. That's not to say it never happened. As a zookeeper, I had to stay late a handful of times over the years. Sometimes, it was to finish an exhibit by a certain date. Other times, it was helping with a stressed or sick animal. The time I'm going to tell you about, the time that changed my life, was no different. Not at first, anyway. It was approaching the witching hour when I finally finished filling in the day's diary. I had entered all the information into the special program we used to keep track of each animal's overall health and well-being. But I still had one more thing I wanted to do. The reason I was still at work so late was because one of the giraffes, a male named Jaffe, had been acting strangely. The truth is, I was worried about all six of the giraffes. Jaffe had been acting the strangest, but I'd seen some alarming behavior from all of them when coming to work the past several mornings. So after I finished entering the day's information into the computer program, I headed over to their enclosure to check on them before I left for the night. As I approached the giraffe enclosure, still too far away to see clearly, I heard a commotion. There was the clomping of hooves as the large animals moved frantically around. Then there came the long, loud, and low-pitched growl that I'd only ever heard a handful of times from a giraffe. It was the kind of sound they made in the wild while under attack from a predator. I hurried up to the exhibit and peered over the railing, the low lights on the walkway behind me providing dim illumination. Five of the six giraffes were gathered on one side of the enclosure, while Jaffe, the largest, was on the other side. The other five were staring over toward him as if he was the source of the threat. But that didn't make sense to me. Giraffes are loyal, and the group never had problems before. Jaffe was in the corner, side on to me. He shook his body violently and whipped his head down toward the side of his body I couldn't see. I heard what sounded like a sheet flapping in the wind just before a large, dark shape lifted from Jaffe's side. It launched into the air before landing directly on the giraffe's back. I stared, heart suddenly crashing in my chest. The thing was large and winged, but the wings weren't feathered. They looked to be faintly furry and leathery, like a bat's wings. But it was much too large to be a bat. It was the size of a man. I gaped, eyes traveling up to the thing's dark and pointy-eared head, and I realized what it was doing. It was drinking Jaffe's blood. Still thinking it was some kind of large bat, I shouted, Hey! The thing detached its mouth from Jaffe and twisted its head to look at me. My veins turned to ice. It had the face of a man. The features were distorted slightly, with a pig nose, dark hair, and sharp, bloody teeth. But it wasn't hard to see that a man's face was there, underneath. While I was still comprehending what I was looking at, the thing jumped from Jaffe's back, lifting with powerful flaps of its huge wings, and it flew directly at me. I turned to run. It was the only thing I could think to do. But even as I bolted toward the nearest shelter, which happened to be a bathroom some 40 yards away, I could hear the thing gaining on me. I knew I wouldn't make it to the bathroom, so I turned to fight, hoping I could scare it off. The moment I got turned around, the creature crashed into me, slamming me to the concrete. The last things I remember were my head cracking into the walkway and the look on the thing's half-human face, its eyes wide and teeth bared. Before I lost consciousness, I was sure I was about to die. But when I awoke later, I was lying in the middle of the walkway, a small pool of dry blood where my head had been. I felt for an injury, but there was no pain, and I couldn't find a bump on my head. My mouth tasted of copper, and my stomach felt like a bottomless pit. As I got to my feet, the day's first rays of sunshine peeked over the horizon, and as they touched my forehead, I screamed. My skin was sizzling.
elephants are some of the smartest creatures on Earth. Researchers around the world have found out all kinds of stuff about these amazing mammals. They're able to recognize languages. They are excellent problem solvers. They show empathy and mourn their dead. They even have more neurons than humans do. Granted, many of them are for operating their massive bodies, but still, they're incredible. But I didn't have to read news articles or scientific studies to know this. As a zookeeper, I've been working with elephants for years. I've seen their amazing abilities with my own eyes. I'm sure you've heard people say that they prefer animals over humans. Most of the time, they're joking. But when I tell you that I've developed deep bonds with the elephants in my zoo, I need you to believe me. Because it will help you make sense of the story I'm about to tell you. It started when I was headed to the elephant barn one morning several months ago. The barn is essentially a large, sturdy warehouse with a big cage inside. It's where we gather the elephants so we can do some training and inspect them for injuries or illnesses. The bars in the barn cage are widely spaced, allowing humans to slip through if we need to, but keeping the elephants in place. It's a part of the zoo that visitors never see, attached to the elephant habitat with large doors. We have some animal care assistants that help get the elephants into the barn every morning, but they're usually already on to their next task when I get to the elephant barn. Not this day. As I approached the door to the barn, it came open and a 25-year-old animal care assistant named Seth stepped out. His eyes went wide and his face flushed. Good morning, I said, wondering why he seemed surprised to see me. He averted his eyes, mumbled a good morning, and went on his way. When I stepped into the barn, I saw that Leonard, one of the elephants, was standing near the bars. Hi, Leonard, I said in my usual jovial way. I knew something was wrong when Leonard didn't flap his ears or rumble as he always did to greet me. It took him a while to get back to normal that day, but I couldn't find anything wrong with him. He had a few minor scrapes and bruises, but that was fairly common for him since he liked to roll around in the dirt and scratch himself on the boulders we had in the habitat. Still, something seemed off, and I figured it had to do with Seth. The way he looked when he came out of the barn bothered me. Although we had cameras in the habitat, we didn't have any in the barn since the elephants didn't spend much time in there without being accompanied by a human. So when I left work that night, I went and bought a wireless, battery-powered camera. The next day, I set it high up in the barn on a crossbar. The footage from the next couple of days showed nothing out of the ordinary. Seth and the other assistants got the elephants into the barn and shut the doors. Then they left to assist with the other animals in the zoo. But the footage from the third day was different. It started the same, with the assistants getting the elephants inside. Then they left. But two minutes later, Seth came back into the barn and grabbed one of the rods I used for positive reinforcement training. These wooden rods are about four feet long and have a simple rubber ball at one end. The ball is used to gently touch the elephant somewhere or to point where we want them to go. This allows us to train the elephants to do things like show us the bottoms of their feet or open their mouths so we can check their health. With rod in hand, Seth coaxed Leonard over to the bars. Then he turned the rod around so the ball was on the wrong end, near where he was holding it. When Leonard got close, Seth reached through the bars and hit the elephant with the hard end of the stick. He did it again, striking the animal with all his might. Leonard moved away, but Seth slipped through the bars and struck the animal three more times before Leonard turned around and cried out. Seth hurried back through the bars, a smile on his face. It's hard to describe how I felt at that moment. It was as if a bright ball of flame ignited deep inside me. It was as if I'd just seen footage of a man beating a member of my family. I was seeing red, and my first thought was to go find Seth and beat the living daylights out of him. But that wouldn't do. I would go to jail. Sure, I could show the footage of Seth to the zoo curator, who might even choose to press animal abuse charges. But what would happen then? Would it cure Seth of his sick behavior? Then I thought about how it was common for serial killers to abuse or kill animals. It showed a lack of empathy. What if he went on to kill someone? What if I had a chance to keep a dangerous man from doing evil, but I didn't take it? In the end, I knew it wasn't really up to me. 
I decided that I'd give Leonard the chance to do what he felt was right. A few more days went by and I kept a close eye on the camera feed from my phone while Seth was around. I stayed out of sight near the entrance to the elephant barn, phone in hand, waiting. And Seth didn't disappoint. It was a Thursday morning when I saw Seth come back into the barn again on the camera feed. I put the phone away and rushed over to the barn, slipping silently inside while Seth was focused on coaxing Leonard to him. The memory of him beating my friend was all I could think of. I ran up to him and slammed into him with my shoulder just as he was turning around, attention drawn by my footfalls. Since he was already lined up with a gap in the bars, he went flying through to the other side, dropping the training rod and falling to the dirt floor. Leonard had been in the process of coming reluctantly over, so he saw the whole thing. He was standing just a few feet away from where Seth went down. He looked at his assaulter, big black eyes full of intelligence. Then he looked up at me. I nodded. It's up to you, I said. Seth scrambled to his feet just in time to get a trunk to the face. He flew several feet, crashing into the wall and falling to the ground again. Leonard hustled over, raised up on his back legs and brought his forelegs down on Seth. The sound of his skull and rib cage cracking under the elephant's immense weight echoed off the walls. Leonard took no pleasure in it, but both he and I knew it had to be done. He moved over to the other elephants, who immediately began to console him in their unique way. It went down as a tragic accident. What Seth had been doing alone in the cage was a mystery. Unfortunately, we didn't have any cameras in the barn, and I only got there after the deed was done. Maybe you think it was the right thing, Maybe not, but I don't regret what I did one bit, and neither does Leonard. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.